I'm not really much of a player. I'm more of a builder, which is fairly common among what, what they call luthiers. Uh, it's a sort of an old, old term for guitar builders or instrument builders, string instrument builders. But I like the really pleasing tone of the, of the U. This is a uh, called a low G uke. This string is usually an octave higher, uh, which gives it this sound. But the guitar players especially like to have that low string. And it's uh, essentially tuned in the same intervals as the first four strings on a guitar. So you can play it with the same chords that you would be playing on the on the uh, a four string guitar. That's a C, which on a guitar would be a G. So it's easy transposition for guitar players. And one of the best uh, uh, around here as far as playing uke, a guitar player adapting, is Dorian Michael, who lives up in, uh, in Cambria, uh, Cayucas area. Uh, he's uh, a wonderful uh, steel string guitar player, and uh, he has one of my ukes tuned to a low G, and he's a fabulous uke player. Um, several people uh, in the area playing uke. There, uh, there are some groups of uh, uke players around. There's the uh, San Luis Obispo Uke Society, I think that's what they call themselves. And they meet at uh, Spikes, or did, I'm not sure. They meet at Spikes uh, once a month and just get together and exchange music and play and have a good time. And then uh, uh, my Lorelei belongs to uh, a group called the Cayucalele Ladies. And they, uh, they're they a group that uh, boogie board up in Cayucas and also uh, get together and play uke. And they, they do the same thing. It's all women and uh, they're having a great time doing it. And uh, uh, several groups and and big big societies like the Santa Cruz Ukulele Society it's huge and it probably has 300 members and they always have something going up there but it's a fun instrument and it's sort of another door as far as music goes um, uh, it's another society within itself and uh, uh, a lot of people kind of sneer at the instrument but it's uh, it's a valid instrument and it's really fun to play and you can there's lots of music inside these things this instrument is made of uh, a local walnut a beautiful chocolate walnut this is not stained or colored in any way it just has an oil finish on it and um, I, I just love this stuff it's uh, from a tree an old black walnut tree uh, from Arroyo Grande um, I got this from Don Seawater, who supplies wood in the county here. He has a, a company over on, on Prado Road. But uh, it's, it's just beautiful wood, very, very curly and highly figured and super black. And I, I just really like it. Other woods on the uke, uh, this is an ebony fretboard and an ebony bridge, African wood. Uh, the headstock overlay is... Uh, it's a little veneer, it's a traditional uh, guitar builder's thing. It's uh, Brazilian rosewood. And the neck is Honduran mahogany, uh, one of my favorite woods and one of the best instrument builder's tone woods around. But it's, uh, it's quite a project. It's like building a guitar, uh, just smaller. It's actually the same processes and pretty much the same materials. This has a little rosewood pick guard. And uh, this ivory grained binding is a plastic binding, uh, nitrocellulose binding. And it's, uh, it's I think mine are kind of fancy, but I, I, uh, I like the traditional style of guitar building. And my goal is to make them sound as good as they look. So it's a very sweet sound. A 
Like I say, I'm not a uke player, but I enjoy playing around with it. I started making ukes um, because a friend wanted me to repair one that he had. He had a uh, kind of an old uke, and he said, hey, can you fix this for me? And I got into it, and I thought, boy, this would be really fun to build. So I uh, started up and built one, and built another one, and decided I was going to do it. Initially, when I opened my shop here, I was building five-string banjos, and uh, I still do, but uh, not nearly at the volume that I'm building my ukes. But uh, I uh, play in a band called the Howley Playboys, and we play Hawaiian cowboy viper blues, which is a real mix of music, but a uh, uh, really fun band, Ted Waterhouse playing guitar, and, and uh, Alan Dick playing violin, I play uh, upright bass, Jerry Pyle plays uke and percussion, and uh, Don Young, who's the president of National Resophonic Guitar, plays guitar and slide guitar, and we have the most fun. We've been together for about 12 years playing Hawaiian Cowboy Viper Blues. This is uh, some of the California uh, cedar, and then above it there is another lot of walnut that I got several years ago, and it's drying out. You can see how the cracks in this, uh, it, it takes about another two years before you can make an instrument. So you just let it sit and naturally lose the, the moisture. Yeah. But I have uh, some pieces up here that have been here for two years and they're smaller billets that I kind of cut into the correct shape and they sit for a while and I put wax on the ends. You can, it, keeps it keeps it from drying out too fast. Here's an old piece of, uh, this is very old, uh, about 50 years old been cut for 50 years. This is a piece of very nice, tight uh, Sitka spruce. I'll use this for faces for ukes. Uh, th this is the bandsaw blade. It's, this is a real special blade. It's uh, very thin and super sharp and really high tension. Uh, really ideal for this kind of thing. So, we normally have a fence over here and So this is called resawing, and and now they have a book matched pair, and then you glue these two pieces together, um, forming uh, the face. Of course, the outside shape is cut later. These are the braces inside the face. Uh, just stiffens it, and makes it. Uh, uh, I think it helps to transmit the vibrations throughout the face and. Uh, makes it a lot stronger. Otherwise it would uh, tend to bow up and, and then you got problems. This is a little uh, mahogany doubler strip in here. To, it's got a seam going down the middle. It's hard to see. You can see a little bit of it there. That's the glue seam and this keeps the seam together. This is called X-bracing. It's a Typical guitar style bracing, and you can see why they call it X bracing. This is a beautiful Brazilian rosewood back. Um, this is called ladder bracing, and it's, it's typically what's done on the back of, of guitars and, and ukes. It also has a curve in it. Um, the, the back braces are curved. And let's see, I've got an instrument here. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, this has a, just a slight curve to it this way. And it also has a slight curve this way. And uh, that makes it a lot stronger and I think gives it kind of a parabolic shape for, for uh, uh, focusing the, uh, the vibrations. And it, it's a nice feel. If it's perfectly flat, it, this, it looks too flat. So there again, it's kind of a style thing. And also, it's, the sides are narrower here than they are back here on the back, which is another style thing, typical of guitars. 
This one's waiting for binding. And binding is a um, strip of wood or plastic. This is a, a nitrocellulose plastic. It's called uh, ivroid. It's got little grains in it that look, make it look like ivory. And this binding is glued around the outside of the, uh, the instrument, mainly to protect the wood and to seal the wood. Now if you, you know, it always gets bumped on the corners, so this really makes it a lot, uh, a lot safer for the instrument. And it looks nice. It's a, it's a nice trim. Um, I also use wood binding. Um, let's see. I can reach the... This is um, curly maple binding. You can see the little curls in there. It really looks nice when it's finished. And this, uh, this particular instrument, Brazilian rosewood, oh, I broke it. It breaks very easy. This instrument will have uh, uh, the maple binding on it, which really is pretty. Yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's more trouble, but it's, uh, I think it's worth it, especially on an instrument like this. Brazilian rosewood is one of those unobtainiums right now. It's, uh, there's an embargo on cutting Brazilian rosewood in the jungles of uh, Brazil and South America. It's, traditionally the most beautiful wood for, uh, for an instrument, uh, for guitars especially. Here's a, uh, an instrument that has uh, the curly maple sides and back. I really like it and it's a, it's a little different sound, it's a little bit harder sound, a little brighter sound. This has uh, uh, also nitrocellulose binding on it, but this is a tortoise shell design. Nice contrast. This is koa, which is the traditional wood for a Hawaiian ukulele. This is really nice curly stuff and beautiful. Um, uh, there's also an embargo on cutting koa. They've been just stripping the jungles in Hawaii of this. It's a, um, it's a type of acacia tree that only grows in Hawaii. And, uh, it takes a long time for it to grow? It takes a while to grow and, um, uh, you know, as wet as it is over there, um, uh, it's, it takes quite a while to dry it out. It's a very light wood and um, good for instruments, but it's not the best in my opinion. My favorite is uh, Honduran mahogany. And it's very stable wood and, and a little mellower sound. And that guitar, the Martin guitar we were looking at in there, that's... Uh, that's Honduran mahogany too. Same design, I use uh, uh, spruce braces on all of my instruments. Spruce being really strong for its weight. It's this, one of the reasons they use spruce and the spruce goose, it's, uh, it's the uh, strongest wood for its density. Really light, but very strong. Type of conifer. This Brazilian rosewood, everybody sees a different picture in here. I kind of see an owl's face in that design. And this is what the book matching does. It sort of matches the design on each side because you're opening it up uh, after you cut it and it's, uh, it's a mirror image of itself. Here's another piece of Brazilian rosewood to show you how different it can be. And then here's still another Brazilian rosewood. It's almost black, very, very dark. Looks nice with finish. This is more of that uh, Arroyo Grande walnut, black walnut. That's beautiful too. It's beautiful and it's, I, I think it's a good tone wood too. It's uh, I'm really happy to to have this wood, thanks to Don Seawater. This is the side bending machine. Um, it's electrically heated, and this is the shape. 
course of the ukulele. You can see it like that. This is more or less a raw side. Um, and sides put in here. This is, these are pneumatic cylinders on each side. And when you actuate the, the valve, it pulls down on the side at a kind of a nice uh, even rate. This is hot and this is also hot and they're about uh, right around 200 degrees. Not too hot, we don't want to burn the wood. Uh, but as it pushes down, um, it'll bend the waste and then when the waste is bent, I kind of pull down on these manually and I have clamps that clamp on each end with bungee cords and they pull, they pull it down till it wraps around. So the, uh, the bent side looks like this. When it cools down, it's, it doesn't go back to its original straight shape. If I can get this in here without breaking it. There we go. So there, that's, that's, the, that's what it looks like when the side is bent. And these are being, of course, pulled down by bungee cords. And, and as soon as, w what you do is you soak the uh, side, uh, not for too long, maybe 15 or 20 minutes per side. It doesn't need a lot of water. It just needs the water to stay cool. It's not really a steam process. It's a heat process. And uh, uh, by the time you're done bending, uh, the water's gone. So when you take it out, it's, it's pretty dry. A certain shape that, that that is better or or does the tone matter you know like the shape well matter? <laughs> I think shape um, shape is a matter of style um, uh, my ukes you can see does it sound differently with the, with the shape or it, it could uh, I think everything affects the sound of the instrument uh, I don't know how much the shape affects it the the um, displacement of the instrument, the, the amount of air inside affects it quite a bit, so the, so the shape would affect it. But some of the popular Hawaiian ukes are um, called pineapples. And they're, they don't have this waist. They just come around in the curve like this. They, they're, uh, they don't have a waist, and they're called a pineapple uke, and they sound fine. So it's a, mostly a, a traditional shape. And people say they like to put their, uh, their knee where the, the waist is on the instrument. So it kind of nestles there. But uh, this is a, I made this bender out of aluminum and it uses cartridge heaters and electric and pneumatic cylinders to pull it down. Maybe fancy, um, but uh, it was an interesting project. And it works very well. I can buy, I can bend uh, 50 sets in a day. You know, if you cut it out of a solid block, it wouldn't be strong. You would have ingrain in here, and it would tend to break real easy. Uh -huh. So, but this is very strong. It's really a strong way to do it. That's the current run. Those are in different phases. Here's one where I've. These are like little reinforcement for the for the grain on the sides, and these are the the neck block and tail block. And then here's kind of the next phase. It gets these, which are called linings. And it gives you more area to glue the, the face and the back to. That gets glued in there like that. So that's all that little lining does. And I, I make those the same way I make the sides. In fact, they're made out of sides that I might reject and on this bending machine. This is a fun thing. I, I made this. And you can see here I've got a neck that I put in there. This, is a, 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 this has already been carved. You can see the little dimples and things in there in the texture of the back of the neck. And the way it's carved is a, um, there's a the router mounted here and a round nosed cutter. And on this side, there's a, um, a ball on a little stylus, the same diameter as the, um, as the ball cutter. And whatever, the, whatever 
this ball sees on this side, it cuts on this side. Um, and I have a, it's motorized through this little screw over here so I can move it along and just whatever, whatever I, the ball touches over there, this cutter will cut. Like making a key. Like making a key, exactly. And it, they call it a pantograph. Um, it's two parallel arms that go up and down and side to side together. So they're rigidly linked and uh, this little pattern I made out of rosewood and it's, it's exactly what I want the neck profile to be. And then this, uh, this screw over here, I've got a, a little motor attached to it and it, it moves along and I can change the direction of it. So as I'm carving, I've got a foot switch and I can carve a little bit and then move, move the screw along, and move the screw along. It takes me about, um, I think about 10 minutes to carve a neck. And if I was doing this by hand with files and sanding blocks, it would take me probably two hours to do the same amount of work. On the setup, I go into my clean room in there where we were and, and uh, I put the strings on, but I do the finishing here too. Uh, the finishing is just a wipe on, wipe off finish. It's, I don't use any spray equipment. And I just, uh, <clears throat> it's a polyurethane uh, you put on, you let it sit for a little while, and you wipe it off. And I really like it because it feels real smooth, and it's uh, it's uh, it's safe to apply, and uh, it feels really well. If we were pretending to be done with this uke, um, it's got strings on it, and it's tuned up and ready to play. And um, anyone who's been around string instruments for a while know that um, the more an instrument is played, the, the better it sounds. It always improves in sound. And I, uh, one of the theories is that um, by playing it, the vibrations uh, relieve a lot of the stress in the woods that are just naturally in the woods and then from gluing uh, clamps and all this other stuff. It's, there's, it's a pretty tight little unit. But um, by playing it, it tends to loosen that. And I, I agree with that theory. But this little machine has four picks here. And um, it goes like that, and the picks come up and, and pick the strings. I have a uh, calculator here that I made into a um, one plus one equals, made into a counter. Every, so every time it goes around, it clicks a little switch and and counts the revolutions, counts the number of times that they get plucked. So the instrument gets fit in there. And I like to play my instruments a million strokes, which takes about nine or 10 days. <clears throat> so this is going on, when I have a run of instruments, this is going on constantly. 24 hours a day. And I don't get used to it. I never get used to it. It's always something there in the back of my mind. But it, it's, it's not too noisy with the little sound deadening and you don't hear a lot. I, I need to build another one because my volume is going up. But we're at 50 strokes already. A million strokes, yeah. And it makes a difference when you pull it out. It actually sounds more open and fuller. And the strings are worn out. It wears a little groove right in the string, so I have to replace the strings. But I, I, think, it's, I think it works well. I, it makes a big difference. These are nylon strings. Uh, it takes longer for them to stretch up and, and get to their tension and hold that tension. So you're constantly tuning them after you, after you put new strings on. You're just constantly tuning. But uh, it's just one of those things that nylon string players, uh, classical guitar players, get used to. The, uh, the low string on this, 
the low G string is a, a viola string. It's actually a wound string, a silver wound string. Um, you can't see the windings. It's, it's, uh, it's flat wound, which means it's, they put the winding on there and then they grind it so all the little bumps are, are flat. Makes it sound when you... Doesn't make, it, make noise when you run your finger on it. And the reason uh, I wanted a wound string on that is it's, it's a heavier string. And so it's, it, it, it gets to that uh, pitch with a little more tension, which makes it easier to play. If it were nylon, it would be real loose and, and kind of rubbery. There again, the education at Ernie Ball, I learned so much uh, because I was involved in the, um, the string manufacturing there. These are nylon strings. They're uh, made of a, a nylon material that's extruded and then they grind the outside diameter to the, the correct diameter. The main thing to look for is that the instrument's ma made well and that um, uh, you like the sound of it. That's the main thing is that you like the way it sounds and the, you like the way it plays. And one of the things about um, instruments is the playability, the, the distance the string is from the fret. Sometimes they're really high, which means you spend a lot of effort pushing the string down to the fret. And it also changes the, uh, the tone and, or the pitch if you have to stretch that string too far. That's mainly, the, that's, that's mainly what you look for. Plus, the tuners, especially on ukes, they used, they used to use a friction tuner, which just means you tighten a screw back here and uh, it, it tightened the friction on the, on the uh, tuner so it wouldn't slip. And this uses a planetary gear. That's uh, one big gear with, with three small gears inside, which means uh, there's, a, um, there's a low ratio. This is, these are five to one, uh, which makes tuning easier. It's just much more precise. The, uh, the friction tuners are one to one, and it's really hard to keep them in tune. But these are these uh, tuners are expensive. These are about uh, seventy dollars a set. But worth it if you play a lot and if you want to stay in tune. And you would just make sure that the neck is is uh, not too warped. And uh, you look at the constructions. <laughs> I was going to say, be sure it says this on the headstock. <laughs>